I'm standing here at a crossroads, at the fork in the road, at that place that represents physically, visually, the hinge points upon which our lives turn, but that so often we evade or avoid. I want to talk to you about the power of intention. And I want to call the question today as we're on this journey, Dallas Willard's little book, Renovation of the Heart. Have you formed the intention to live in the vision of the kingdom of God? And if not, what do you intend? What do you want to intend? There's a famous story, Cortez the Explorer in 1519 came to the New World with hundreds of men. And it is said after they had landed, he burned the ships in the harbor as a way of saying there is no going back. From this moment on, for better or worse, we are here. And of course, conquistadors, colonialism carries an awful lot of baggage. And the story itself, from my understanding, is thought most likely to be apocryphal. But it won't go away. Because there is something in the soul that thrills to the story of a human being who totally commits her or his life to a compelling vision. But the vision is not enough. Dallas writes in his book, still more than vision is required, and especially there is required intention. Projects of personal transformation rarely, if ever, succeed by accident, drift, or imposition, and that is because of the centrality of the will. The will can do very little. It's got a very small power, but what it can do is utterly indispensable and sacred, and no one can choose for you. In the outer world, we often stand back to look to see what will happen. Will rain ever come to California or not? Will COVID ever go away? Will the stock market go up? We wonder about causes that far transcend us. But in the inner world, in your little kingdom, it is far different. Here, it is choice that matters. Although fallenness and brokenness and sin and the evil one will try to keep us blind from this power. Dallas writes, imagine a person wondering day after day if she's going to learn Arabic or become a master chef or run the Boston Marathon or if he or she's going to get married to a certain person. Just waiting to see, will it happen? That would be laughable. But many people actually seem to live in this way with respect to the major issues involving them and with a deplorable outcome. That explains a lot about why lives go as they do. But to learn a language... And for the many even more important concerns of life, we must intend the vision if it is to be realized. It's not enough to study it, know it, think about it. You must do this. That is, we must initiate, bring into being those factors that would bring the vision to reality. And then we don't stop there. Now, an intention is brought to completion only by a decision to fulfill or carry through with the intention. It is striking that we sometimes say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We never say it's paved with good decisions. There is a finality to decision that binds us. Dallas writes, often we find people who say they intend for something, uh, but it doesn't happen. And maybe external circumstances got in the way or deeply rooted habits thwarted for a time. But often it turns out that what we claim to have intended, we never turn into a decision. And so we never thoroughly intended. William Law, who was a great spiritual master from many, many centuries ago, wrote once, If you look to see why you're not as transformed as many of the early followers of Jesus were, you will discover it is not through ignorance or inability. You just simply never fully intended it. But oh, our ability to finesse ourselves out of seeing this clearly. Dallas writes, procrastination is a common and well-known way in which intention is aborted. Yes, but not today. You ever procrastinate? 
Would you like a little more time to think about it? There's a great baseball player a long time ago, Mickey Mantle, and when he died in his early 60s, it was a very tragic death, and he publicly announced, uh, he said, you know, I'm not a hero like many people think. I, I've lived a really bad life. He was a raging alcoholic and knew what path to get on to become sober, but didn't take it year after year, decade after decade. He was unfaithful to his wife, uh, mistreated many, many women, was a horrible dad. His sons suffered greatly. And, and part of what's so awful about it was uh, it's not like he set out to be evil and decide to go down a path that would wreak utter destruction. Just every day he'd wake up, not today. I will not do the things that I need to do to become the person I know I want to be. Not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. And the marriage he could have built, the dad he could have been, sons he could have raised, people he could have blessed, life he could have inspired, never got lived, although he had good intentions. Dallas goes on, uh, on the other hand, the profession or statement of intentions is a primary way of negotiating one way through life, regardless of whether or not the intention professed is really there. And I know a lot about this. You could ask my wife, Nancy, when our three children were very small, all of them preschool age at one point, was there ever a time when we were in conflict over division of labor issues where I professed an intention, oh yes, I want to equally own the burden of servanthood around our home. But it was more an attempt to finesse a way out of conflict than it was a sincere decision. Actually, you don't have to ask Nancy about that. I would be glad to tell you if you would like to text and ask me. Dallas goes on. If the genuine intention is there, the deed reliably follows. But if it is not there, the deed will most likely not be there either. So now I stand with you at the crossroads. You know of the vision that Jesus has set before that is un incomparable as an opportunity for human life. Have you made a decision? Which road will you choose? What do you intend? And can you do what you say? This is from a, a book called by Stephen Hayes, uh, where he raises that question. It's very striking. Abraham Lincoln, when he was in the pit of despair one time, he had broken off his engagement to Mary Todd. And what troubled him most was not that he wasn't sure about her or the relationship. It was that he made a promise and he didn't keep it. And he said, I always regarded my ability to keep my word as the gemstone of my character. Not language that gets used often in our day. There is often a gap, Hayes notes, between our professed intention and our actual behavior. The way to fill this gap is to choose to do things for no other reason than you said you would do them. At one time in human history, this was a common practice and was considered a kind of moral training. This is by a psychologist. It still exists in our spiritual and religious institutions, but at a much weaker level than it once was. So let's make it strong. Examples might include getting up and going to bed at an early hour just because you said, forgoing favorite foods for a period of time just because you said, fasting just because you said, wearing an uncomfortable shirt. They used to do this in the Middle Ages as a spiritual discipline just because you said, writing in a journal, giving money to someone, serving for an hour, confessing something to a friend, honoring these commitments simply because you said that you would do them because something is growing strong in you when you form an intention that becomes a decision in service of a glorious decision that says, I will go that way and not that way. G.K. Chesterton, a great Christian thinker, once wrote a fabulous essay called In Defense of Rash Vows. And he noted that often in times when great ones follow Jesus, they love to make commitments that would bind themselves. In our day, very often, we avoid doing that. We don't want to burn the ships because tomorrow we might feel like doing something else, we're afraid. 
The great ones made decisions precisely because they were afraid they would turn into the kind of people that would just do whatever they felt like doing. The man who makes a vow, Chesterton wrote, makes an appointment with himself at some distant time or place. This is who I will be. This is what I shall do. This is the vision I shall live. I close with this quote, asking this question, have you made the intention, the decision, that you will have the life that Jesus offers, whatever it takes? If you want more help with that, go to that email devotional. You can text and get that and work this one through. Chesterton imposes what's offered to people that don't make that kind of decision to those who do. There are thrilling moments, doubtless, for the spectators and the dabblers and the uncommitted among us. But there is one thrill that is known only to the soldier who fights for his own flag, the artist who starves himself for his own illumination, the lover who finally makes his own choice. And it is this transfiguring self-discipline that makes the vow a truly sane thing. All around us is the city of small sins, abounding in backways and retreats. But surely, sooner or later, the towering flame will arise from the harbor, announcing that the reign of cowards is over, and a man is burning his ships. Hey, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell so you never miss an episode. There are emails that go along with each video. If you'd like to receive those, you can let us know at becomenew.me slash subscribe.